now. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the William M. Starko Planetarium's Zoom webinar page right here. Um, it is the beginning of June and we are still in spring. We have not entered the astronomical summer. So this is our spring prairie skies show. And um, I'm Eric Johnson. I'm the director of the William M. Starko Planetarium. My, pro my pronouns are he, him, his. Uh, with me here is Waylena McCulley. Say hi, Waylena. Hi. All right. Um, Waylena is our show producer, um, and she has as her virtual background what well, a lovely picture of our lobby. It is our solar window uh, that was uh, donated by the namesake of the planetarium, Bill and his wife, uh, Mary Lou Starkle. Um, and uh, I think it's a really appropriate thing for us to help celebrate pride. So uh, there you go. I think that's uh, just a lovely thing to add to all of this. Um, but yes, it's June. Uh, we we are going to show you what we can see in the stars, uh, among the stars in June here in just a few moments. Um, but I think what I need to do first is to have you folks see a little bit of information um, about an upcoming event. Perhaps some of you tried to uh, look around for the lunar eclipse that happened a couple of weeks ago. I know I promoted it at our last Prairie Skies. Um, I know in Champaign that one was clouded out. Um, which was a shame. But then again, also that event, we didn't actually get to see that whole thing. We didn't get to see totality, the part that people, when they're trying to get as many clicks as possible, are calling a blood moon. <laughs> so yeah, um, so that was something we were not able to see around here um, because of the weather being un, um, uncooperative. Now, uh, coming up on Thursday, we will actually have a solar eclipse occurring, okay? Um, I'll go to Stellarium so you can see exactly what that looks like first. Let's see if I can bring this up. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah. Oh, never mind. I was gonna say, what, what kind of eclipse is it? What kind of solar eclipse? Oh, okay. Well, um, around here, we won't see much of the sun being blocked. It'll only be partially blocked. Mm -hmm. So it'll be an, a partial solar eclipse. Um, and if you'd like, I can show you what, it, what this eclipse will look like at its best, or I can show you what it looks like from Champagne. What do you prefer, Waylena? Mm, honestly, you could do both. Just take the time to do it. Okay, well, I was planning to do both. I just yeah. wanted to hear what you wanted to see first. That's all, not a problem. All right, well, since I've got this one up right now, I told you folks it's going to be on June 10th. So we're going to do a lot of cheating here. So I'm switching it up 2021, 610. And this is happening right at sunrise. Okay. So here we switch it now to 505 a.m. And here's a problem. Notice the bright spot is right behind the planetarium. <laughs> so if you're standing outside of the planetarium on that morning, on Thursday morning, you are not gonna see anything, okay? Which no. is a darn shame. Let's try another option. Let's see if we can get a little bit of a better observing from Prairie Winds Observatory, which is operated by the Champaign-Urbana Astronomical Society. Uh, looks like from where Waylena took this photograph, it would be behind that <laughs> building as well. That's okay, that's perfectly fine. Here's what we're gonna do, we're gonna cheat. Take away that ground, and put that up. And I need to do <laughs> one other thing that I knew was gonna happen. Um, right now we have our moon as huge, so I need oh, to make it less yeah. huge. Okay, so we're gonna zoom in on what's going on there. So if okay. you were able to look through earth, you would see part of the sun cut into by the moon. And that's what that looks like right now. Okay, oops. But you have to look through the earth. Yes, you have to look through the earth. So just put I, your hand up to the screen so you're not seeing that. There you go. There it's now right. you can see this. What you will see is if you can see a very, very flat horizon, all you have to do is move out of the way of the buildings or the trees um, and probably be among the corn, therefore, because it would have, or, or soy, and it would have to be a really flat horizon. Um, you'll be able to see a tiny amount of the sun being 
chopped out right there. I think I like to think of it as like if you took an Oreo cookie and you just took a little bite out of it, that's that's what the sun would look like right there. Now, remember, of course, I never recommend that you folks look at the sun directly. Um, and that's just because it can really damage your retinas. But even though this is being recorded, I'll ask. I'm betting a couple of times you folks probably take little steel little glances at the sun during a sunrise or a sunset, don't you? Do you, Waylena? Hmm. You might just like usually look. not intentionally because yeah. then I can't see anything else. Remember, yeah, exactly. It's still going to be pretty blinding. Um, so yeah. if you want to look for maybe half a second maybe that's okay. And like Waylena said, that can be pretty blinding anyways. You'll probably have to look at the sun for a long time, several seconds to notice that that chunk is being cut out of it. So not worth staring at. Yeah, it's probably not worth staring at. So you might want to grab one of those eclipse glasses. Maybe you have them still from the last eclipse from 2017 um, and you can put those on. Or you can try those other measures. Maybe you've seen the people like get shoe boxes and make a little pinhole camera. Um, a good, really cheap way to do it is if you take your finger and, and you put it like this and you make the pinhole out of the small little opening between, in, in your finger and then watch and see how it's projected onto the ground. That can actually do it as well. Um, but even then, notice this. Uh, I'll put the time back up. This is at 529 in the morning. All right. And we'll let the time here pass a little bit longer. This is going to be done here in Champaign. Less than 10 minutes after this. Basically, if it's 537, it's already too late. That's what you're going to see. We do not get much of an eclipse around here. So this is a very weak partial eclipse. Okay. I see we have another uh, attendee has joined us and his alarm does not go off until 7.30, so. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't so know. He, if... he, he, he won't see it unless I get him up for it. That is fine. He can just always have his sister-in-law call him because she's been up for two hours before then. <laughs> true, true. <laughs> Happy to help. All right. So yeah, that's something she could go check out um, because this will be visible where she lives too, I think. Yeah, all right, perfect. So yeah, it'll be done by about 5.37 on Thursday morning. Now, if you folks can wanna watch see- it? Can we watch it from the North Pole? Oh, yes, we can. That's right, Santa Claus will be able to see this. So let me go ahead and now share with you folks something else. Um, NASA has some very nice Eclipse websites and, and they give you lots of data about basically every eclipse in human history and the eclipses for the next like several thousand years as well okay so they put up this nice infographic showing you what this eclipse path looks like basically anybody in between these little ribbons here is going to see some sort of eclipse notice here illinois is showing you how we have a little partial eclipse that day but everybody inside of this red band right here, stretching from Ontario in Canada through Greenland, right through the North Pole and over to Eastern Russia, they will get what's called an annular solar eclipse, okay? So an annular solar eclipse is a very special kind of eclipse. Waylena is holding up her ring right now. Is that your wedding ring, Waylena, right there? It is. Wonderful. It is. Wonderful. So annular eclipses mean that the sun makes a ring. If you look really closely at how the sun and the moon look on that day, you'll see that the moon looks really, really small. Maybe you folks hear about super moons and micro moons. Sure. Well, this moon is a lot farther from Earth on June 10th. Um, it's at the point that we, that the uh, astronomers would call apogee, all right? Um, when it's farther, the moon looks smaller, so it can't cover up all of the sun. And when Earth, the moon, and the sun are perfectly lined up, you will have that annular solar eclipse because there will be a ring of the sun around the moon, okay? So for people who are trying to get lots of clicks on the internet, they'll call this a <laughs> ring of fire eclipse, okay? Yes. 
I do not look for the clicks. I want the views. No, I don't. <laughs> All right. But yes, those folks who happen to live in that part of the world, they are going to see an annular eclipse right there. All right. Um, and if you're ever looking for a full path of all of these eclipses that are coming up over the next 20 years, you can see them on this page. The one that you really want to mark your calendar for is this one on in 2024 on April 8th. That one actually has a total solar eclipse passing through southern Illinois, um, not far from where we live, but it won't be total where we are now. So can we see the map for that? Oh, of course you may. Let's take a look here. Oh, look at that. Starts over in the Pacific Ocean, runs through Mexico, Texas, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Missouri, uh, maybe a little of Kentucky, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, and also through Ontario. It'll go through, I think, Montreal and Quebec. So yeah, and, a lot and, of and and it goes and in the part of Ohio, uh, it go it gets the closest to where I am right this right here is a few miles. It's it's just not I where I'm at right now is not in totality. Yeah, it's just outside of where you're at, but yeah, I places know. like Indianapolis and Dallas and Cleveland and Buffalo will get totality on that day, hopefully. <laughs> The, uh, the city officials will make sure that their city lights don't turn on automatically when it goes dark <laughs> like that. That would be really nice for those couple of minutes. It will be a fleeting moment, um, but no guarantees on the cities planning ahead for that. Um, but that'll be really neat to check out. All right. So yeah, that's something for you folks to look forward to. That one will be a total eclipse. It's gonna be a lot of fun. If you're looking for when the next annular eclipse is going to be that you might actually want to go see. Oh, sorry. That's the uh, annular eclipse that's happening on Thursday right there. There's the path of annularity right there. I always like these gifts. They make really nice ones. Um, let's see here. The one that I was just talking about, um, October 14th of 2023, there's an annular eclipse right there that's going through the Western US. So if you're interested in seeing one, you might go on that path because there's lots of people that live along that path. All right, I'll stop sharing there and let's go back to Stellarium. All right, um, and we probably should go back to today, shouldn't we? Um, I think I might oh, wait, actually, you, go ahead. Are gonna do the North Pole? Oh. Um, oh, do you want me to show what it looks like from the North Pole? Why not? Okay, sure. I don't do that often enough, and the, the mood has struck has struck us, stricken me. <laughs> stricken. <laughs> stricken. Stricken us. Yes. Okay. So I'll show you folks how we can do this, because I like showing how Stellarium works whenever I can. Um, here I've got the software shared. Um, I think my ground is still not there. Um, let's check if my ground's there. There we go. That is not real ground. Um, I probably should change the landscape to ocean, shouldn't I? Let's go with ocean. We'll imagine that since we're at the Arctic Ocean, um, it would look like this. I would expect to see an iceberg or two, but you know, we'll, uh, we'll allow it. All right. So we're out here in open water because we don't have a landscape for Santa and his... Uh, and his residence in the factory. But oops, all right, we're showing the Arctic Ocean here. Santa just shows up in December, it'll be fine. Okay, um, let's see here. So we need to see on the 10th. I already went back to today by mistake. Let's see here. Uh, okay. We have Stellarium and that's almost as good as a time machine. I have a feeling that now that I'm at the North Pole, I might have a tr bit of trouble with mm. um, the exact time this happens, but we'll see what happens with that. Um, let's see here. I did not change my location yet. I forgot about that. Click, there we go. That'll help a lot. Um, not quite at the North Pole there. I need to get a little higher. Let's click on that. I think that gets me there. Okay, let's see what we've got. The North Pole is got the sun not that high up. It's only going to be about 20 some degrees above the horizon that day. Won't be very high there. Um, I'll leave it to you to mention what you can with the chat. Um, but for now, I'll show this. Mm -hmm. All right. And we'll go with the time and day right there. 
Let's see what happens. Is the moon getting closer? Nope, it's already too late. Okay, so it does happen much earlier in the day. I wasn't sure if this was still central time in Stellarium. Huh, did I do something wrong? Ooh, that's a near miss. I wonder what I did wrong. Well, this is interesting. That path of annularity goes right over the North Pole. Hmm. I wonder what I made a mistake with. Mm -hmm. I've got the North Pole there. I've got the right date, don't I? The date, yeah. Well, that is wild. I wonder, I wonder what mistake I've made. I, I assume it's user error, so yeah. Huh, that is really neat. Not often you get something that's such a surprise like this. I'm glad this is going up on YouTube. <laughs> um, that is so curious. All right, um, let's try one of these other spots and maybe if we change to a different location, yeah. get the desired maybe exactly result. the North Pole is not the place we wanna be. All the maps are showing that, yeah. All right, let's stay here. Okay, I'm gonna go up to Northwestern Greenland and see what happens there. Okay, let's find our sun one more time. I don't feel like scrolling around for it. Let's see this now. I knew I had to rewind because the moon was to the left and I figured, you know, the way that the moon moves through the sky. Okay, that's looking good. That's looking good. There, that's what we were expecting. Let's go in real close so you folks can see the nice ring, the annulus. That's what you would see that day. That's yeah. it, exactly. Yeah, yeah. and that's just be what I remember from the one I saw in 1994, yeah. back when dinosaurs still roamed the earth. <laughs> oh my gosh. It seems like a short time ago, it really does. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, like I said, my wife took a bunch of photographs of this event. It was a lot of fun. We were in New Mexico for uh, seeing this, uh, seeing such an annular eclipse back in 2012. Um, so yeah, those, the, that was a, a fun time. We've got, we've got this whole little sequence of the photos going through the whole thing. And it was, since it was right in Albuquerque, we actually saw it, the uh, annular eclipse ended right before sunset. So mm -hmm. it gets the nice orange and reddish color as well of the sunset. So that was a lot of fun too. Uh, my yeah. 94 was closer to midday right. in the afternoon. And so I got to see all those rings through the trees, just all over the grass everywhere. It was just spectacular. Wonderful. So, all right, I have clicked now to the North Pole again, but we have a slightly different longitude. Let's see what happens this time. Wow, that is so weird. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, Miss is there too. Hmm. I guess I'm but just not I really better go somewhere else to, yeah, to see I, it. Yeah, I, I am just, I am amazed. I, I guess it was just slightly off. I'm surprised it's not showing any partial eclipse either. So I wonder if there's something weird about about the location, um, like be. having it 90 degrees kind of tweaks how the, the program, the software sets it up. We have uh, seen that type of issue with uh, the software before. So I don't know, yeah. that's interesting. Yeah. yeah, if you folks are curious, if you're actually still watching our confusion <laughs> with this, um, take a look at this right here you can pretty clearly see the red path of annularity run is starting right around Lake Superior. It'll start here. Look at that. Look at that. It streaks just barely through the North oh, Pole. Okay. It's wow. definitely hitting it. So I'm not sure what's up. Yeah. 
Yeah. So that is a, a one of those dillies of a pickle right there. So, so, so uh, Jeff said uh, in the chat, it's not a time machine unless you go 88 miles per hour. And then he goes on to say that math gets uh, difficult when it's near the poles. Which I bet you he's absolutely right. Um, he's dealt with that a lot in, in his work too. Yeah. Hmm. I just wanted to see one more time if I could manually adjust the uh, the um, latitude to get a little closer. Oh, I went really far back. Oopsie. Huh. Wow. Look at how close that is. Huh. But you're not sharing, so we can't see it. I'm sorry about that. Thank you. I have to remember exactly what I'm doing. I had to switch back. I'm so sorry. You, this is, you know, when you get a question, you, you forget to be a proper host. So it, it's, um, it, I know it's, it's so, it's so strange. Or, you yeah. know, I've been doing virtual stuff for a year and it's, it's still, yeah. we fall back into the, the patterns that we are mm -hmm. that going to live. Still capable of dead air. Isn't that great? <laughs> All right. Well, folks, here, I'm going to go ahead and bring us back to Champagne. Um, what's nice is that usually if I get the location from the default location, that'll bring us back to here. And then if I bring us to the time, um, now normally I would take us back to today, um, but I'm gonna actually offer one little bit of treat for you all because I thought this was a neat thing to uh, add. Um, and as always, uh, I have my lab and landscape. Usually I start with the planetarium, but let's just go right to Prairie Winds Observatory for this so that we get a nice flat horizon. Um, I'm going to go to tomorrow because I noticed that tomorrow we actually get the International Space Station passing overhead, okay? Um, just a little bit after sunset. Normally I wouldn't say that the ISS right after sunset is gonna be that bright, but it told me on heavensabove.com that the brightness will be about as bright as, you know, the star Sirius, okay? Really? It, it's gonna be pretty good. It says minus 1.4 for the magnitude, okay? Right. So I'm let's- look it up for where I'm at. Let's see, uh, yeah, I, I will wanna check that out myself. So let me make sure that my satellites are on here. I think that's control Z, there they are. Okay, hey, hey, okay. Um, and what we're going to do is I will show you the time so that you can get a sense of this. All right. So there's our sun at exactly tomorrow, roughly, you know, 20. Um, oh, it's, it's, it's rewinding right now. <laughs> OK, um, so about 24 hours from now, you see the sun is getting pretty low there, but it won't set until um, until almost an hour later. So let's go ahead and watch that. I'll get this out of the way for a moment. Always nice to see these sunsets from once in a while. Oh, I don't need to select the sun anymore. And I promise I'll come back to the Western sky right after that because I'm betting we're gonna see a few things as the sun sets right now. Unless I accidentally turned off the planets. I bet I did not. Oh, I see something coming into view. Good, good, good. All right. So that bright object that's right there, that is going to be the first planet we would see tonight. Um, but that's not what I wanted to focus on. Um, oops, I think it's already at about the right time. I have to go just a couple minutes later here. And oh, I get to start right around due west. So let's watch this happen. Um, I think, yeah, this will work. I think it should pop up just fine in about, oh, there it is. Okay. <laughs> Yep, it's moving fast, it moves fast. That is the International Space Station, folks. Um, and of course, naturally, I clicked on something that's docked onto the space station at this time, Crew Dragon 2. <laughs> um, that's just how it goes sometimes. But yeah, it is rather low, but the ISS will be passing overhead um, at about 8.50 tomorrow night here in Champaign, 
Okay, it won't get that high up, but it'll be pretty bright because it'll be reflecting a lot of sunlight back towards us. So I encourage you folks to uh, consider checking that out because from what I saw on Heavens Above, you are not gonna see the ISS here in Champaign um, for a couple of weeks. We won't get any others until after summer begins. If you looked at the ISS, you saw it disappeared right before it set, and that was just because it passed into Earth's shadow at that very moment. So that yeah, was I don't think I, I don't think I get any passes, or I might need to update the app and check. I'll I'll mm -hmm. check again later because yeah. all it was showing me was daytime uh, passes okay. with the um, ham radio frequencies. Oh, nice. All right. Oops. All right. So this is the sky at roughly about 9 p.m. Okay, and the reason why you want to wait until at least nine is because even though you're seeing plenty of stars in my field of view here, um, understand that I try to amplify this brightness for a zoom feed. Um, so these will appear a lot brighter than what you'd actually see in your own skies. Um, so hopefully that will help you out with understanding why you need to wait until there's at least a lot less twilight up in the sky. And that means you want to wait until at least a half hour after sunset. Um, okay, so um, the first thing that I wanted to mention was that first object that we saw, the object that at this time we are calling our evening star. It is right here, it's very low, it is setting right after sunset, um, but if you don't like how early it's setting right now, just keep waiting throughout this year because it's going to only look better, which is really nice. Um, so let's zoom in on it and we will get a close look. There it is. Ooh, hey, hey, okay. So notice that there's this little dark sliver up at the top. That is because this planet is actually showing phases just in the way that the moon does, okay? Um, but you see it's very different from what you'd see with the moon if it were at that position in the sky. The moon would look like a crescent if it were setting right after the sun did. But in the case of this planet, it's actually on the other side of the sun at this moment. So it's very, very far away from us comparably. Um, and that's because we're looking at the planet Venus right here. Okay. But Venus, because it's so close to the sun, it reflects a lot of sunlight. It receives a lot of sunlight. And because it's covered in clouds, it reflects a lot of that sunlight. And since it's still very close to us, that's why it's usually the brightest planet you see, okay? Um, if you've been looking at uh, fun space and science news lately, you might have heard about an announcement from NASA. NASA is sending two missions to our sister planet Venus in the coming years. Um, I, it's What's wild is that that is a long time coming. NASA routinely sends missions to Mars, but they have not sent a mission to Venus, as Waylene reminded me, since Magellan over 30 years ago. What was great about the Magellan mission was it was actually allowed us to see and map the entire surface of this planet. Um, those clouds prevent us from seeing any of the surface without using those radar images. Um, so that was a, a really wonderful and useful science mission for us. Okay, I'm going to zoom back out really quick here. There we go. Oh, zoom back out just a little too far. All right, so we've got a few things setting over here in this part of the sky. Uh, I'm going to go just a little bit above Venus, and I see two bright stars, not quite the same color, but almost the same brightness. You are looking at what we call Pollux and Castor, and those are in the constellation known as Gemini. Notice before I even show you the artwork, it kind of looks like two stick figures of people, and they look like they're holding hands, okay? So that's Gemini right there. Those are the twins, okay? And notice that Venus actually is in the constellation Gemini right now, right around the feet of Gemini. And then just over to the left, you notice something really bright, just over to the left of Pollux's, uh, well, from our position, left shoulder, but it's Pollux's right shoulder. Um, this object looks a little bit redder than the other objects, and that is actually the planet Mars right there. Let's get a close look at Mars. There's Mars. We can make Mars even closer. 
Ooh, I want to make Mars even closer than that. Hey, that is a good view of that planet. What's the favorite thing you see on Mars right there, Waylena? Ooh, I see an ice cap. Yeah, I got to say, uh, what Waylena is seeing is a really great sign. That's something that we've been able to see for centuries. As soon as we had good enough telescopes to get a good enough resolution of this planet, people have been seeing those little patches of white at the north and south poles of Mars. And they are actually mostly made out of water ice, okay? Mars has another kind of ice. Have you heard of dry ice? Dry ice is made out of carbon dioxide and Mars does have that as well, but those ice caps are mostly made out of water. Nowadays, since we have these great telescopes that can give us extremely detailed pictures of the surface of Mars, and we also have space probes that have mapped the surface of Mars as well, this image is actually showing you some of those details. When I look at this image right here of Mars, I see this nice gash at the bottom. That's Vallis Marineris, a humongous canyon on this planet. Um, it's as long as the contiguous United States. It would run from one ocean to the other. That's how long it is. And then you notice these little zits, these pimples just above it in this image right here. Those are four humongous volcanoes on Mars. The three down here are part of Tharsis Montis, okay? And then the one up here is called Olympus Mons. Basically, it's named after Mount Olympus. Uh, it is a humongous volcano. Um, it's basically, it's three times taller than Mount Everest, and it is as big as the state of Missouri. It pretty much rivals Arizona. It's huge. It's a huge volcano. Okay. Do you have any super superlatives you want to add about these crazy volcanoes or the, that crazy canyon? <laughs> no, no. Okay. I mean, this is one of the best, this is like the quintessential Mars feature picture that we have here. That's right. Yeah. This is just Mars showing us its best side at this very second. Oftentimes when we zoom in on Mars, we're like, oh, I can maybe see almost one of those things or it's, oh, it's the other side of the planet. And you usually have to wait and let it rotate a little bit. Mars rotates a little bit slower than Earth does. Um, so it takes a little while. Um, but yeah, right now, apparently, if you were to look at Mars tomorrow night at 9 p.m., you'd get this great view that you probably can't see from the telescope in your backyard. <laughs> but you can see it here, which is real nice. All right, we'll zoom back out. Um, next to Mars right there, that's probably its largest moon, Phobos, but it could be Deimos as well. There we go. All right, um, we'll zoom out really far here. Okay. Um, if you're curious about Hydra, woo, wow, Hydra is really, really far. It is a humongous constellation. I'm betting the reason why Hydra came up on here is because the ISS was actually passing through this constellation when we were looking a little earlier. Um, Hydra is not a constellation I look at that often in the night sky. Um, the way I usually point it out is by looking for its brightest star. That's this one right here. It's called Alphard. Alphard's right here. And I'm going to show you folks a really fun way to point out Alphard in your own sky. Usually what astronomers do to help themselves remember the names of stars is by drawing a bunch of lines. Okay. Um, and they'll allow them to connect the dots between things. So speaking of connecting the dots, I really need to put up the chat window so I can see what's going on in there. Ah, it's a bunch of great comments from Jeff. Okay, so um, here, I will draw this line right here. This one, this one, this one, this, and that. We'll draw that too. So this right here is showing you um, a very well-known constellation in the spring sky. Uh, this one reminds Waylena of a certain animal, but it reminded the Greeks of another animal. Um, but it's like an iron. Right, right now, now, it does kind of look like that iron that you play in the Monopoly game. Did you, is that the game piece you usually use? <laughs> that, that no, no, iron. but that's exactly it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, so, so the way I drew this kind of looks like an iron. I've seen people draw this where it actually looks like a mouse, but technically, Which is usually what I see. But yeah, yeah, that's right. That's how Elena sees it. She sees it as a mouse. 
This technically is the constellation Leo right here. The bright star down here by Leo's legs is Regulus. Um, and you see that his head is formed by stars that make up the asterism known as the sickle. Okay, uh, let me take out that annotation for just a moment. Well, I'll just take it out entirely. And it's gonna allow me to actually draw one other line here. If you take that bright star above Regulus, whose name I do not remember, but I would guess it's Algeba, um, and you go down, notice it allows you to point to Alfard. Okay, and that is in my mind how I remember that that is the bright, is brightest star in the constellation Hydra. I know it's right below Regulus in the sky going below Leo. If you want to tell yourself a little story imagining the lion wants to chase this big long serpent, you could, that would be fine. Tell yourselves those stories because that's how people remember these constellations. It's a perfect way to do it. Okay, um, but yeah. Yay, I got it right, it's Algeba. Okay, but yeah, you can go from Algeba to Regulus down to Alphard right there. Now this other constellation that you see barely scratching its way above the horizon. Uh, if you're curious which way we're looking right now, this should be a little bit east of south. Okay, yeah, not by much. This is a constellation we basically never see here in Champagne because of our latitude. Um, and this constellation is called Centaurus, which I think you folks can do the translation there. We're talking about the Centaur. Um, the ISS was running through Centaurus, and that's why that got shown there as well. Uh, Centaurus is actually a relatively famous constellation because the brightest star in the constellation Centaurus is called Alpha Centauri. Um, we cannot see that, that star at all in Champagne, but it's famous simply because that star is only four light years away from us. Now that is an obscenely far distance. We're talking about over 16 trillion miles, not mama million, not baba billion, tr 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 trillion miles. Okay, that is 16 followed by 12 zeros. Okay, it is really far away from us. Um, and yet, that is the closest star to our solar system. The sun's nearest neighbor is Alpha Centauri, and it's so far away, the light from that star takes four years to get to us. What I mean by that is that if you were able to actually see that star and you looked up and you saw that light, that is light from the year 2017. That's how far away it is, okay? By comparison, the light we get from the sun, it travels pretty fast, but it still takes eight minutes to get to us. So the next time you look at the sun, that's the sun from eight minutes ago, okay? Pretty wild to think about there. All right, um, let me see if I've got a couple of other stars and constellations I want to point out, but I think where I'm going to go next is over into the northern part of the sky, because that will help me center where I want to look at things. This is a good way place to look. And yes, I'm in the north. I'm going straight up. And let's draw another line here. Or if Waylena wants to draw any lines, you're, I think you have to. Oh, no, you go ahead. Okay, that's fine. I didn't know if you had any favorite shapes. I, I, I wanted to see if you could draw a shark right now, honestly. I don't think I could. <laughs> That's a callback to when Waylena hosts this using the Digistar system, but I'm on my desktop computer right now. All right, so using these stars right here, we have drawn what is for a lot of people probably the most familiar shape in the sky um, next to maybe Orion's belt. Um, there are seven bright stars right there. Uh, some people see this as a spoon. Some people see this as a plow. Some people see this as a wagon. Or if they just went to Target, they see it as a shopping cart. I don't know. All right. But what we call this is the Big Dipper. Okay. It kind of reminds people of one of those little drinking spoons where you would dip it into a well or a cistern or something, and you just get out a nice cool sip of water from it. That's where the term Big Dipper comes from. And the great thing about the Big Dipper is that the two stars away from the handle of the Big Dipper, you draw a line with them and they point right to this bright star here. It's not the brightest star in the sky, but you'll notice that that bright star that you see there 
is directly above the N. And because it'd be directly overhead, if you're looking from the North Pole, which you know we were at the North Pole a few minutes ago, you would know that this thing would be right over you. So it's our pole star. We call it Polaris. Mm -hmm. Okay. We couldn't see it right now at the North Pole. Yeah, you really couldn't see it right now. That's a great point. Um, one thing I did not show you during that solar eclipse earlier is that if you're at the North Pole right now, the sun is actually not going to set. At the North Pole, everything just circles around the sky. Nothing really rises or sets. But as Earth orbits around the sun, the sun does appear to rise and set. It just takes six months. Okay, the sun rises in March at the North Pole and sets in September. So you don't get to see the North Star from March through September. All right. And with all that twilight, it'd probably be pretty hard to see it at uh, certain points earlier in March and later in September, too. All right. So, yeah, Polaris right here. Notice that Polaris is part of a constellation called Ursa Minor. Um, if you're wondering what that artwork is meant to signify, you see, it kind of looks like a little bear, but I don't think any of your teddy bears ever had tails like that. Neither did mine. Um, but yes, that's supposed to be a little bear right there. We also call it the Little Dipper because the way that the stars make a shape, it kind of looks like a small version of the Big Dipper. By the way, in keeping with that pairing, notice that the Big Dipper is part of a large constellation called Ursa Major. And you can see that Ursa means bear here because that is a big bear with a big inaccurate tail. Okay, so there you go. The big dipper in the big bear and the little dipper in the little bear. All right. Um, and you use the pointer stars of the big dipper to point to Polaris. Um, we can use the big dipper to point to another really bright star that's up in the sky. It's over here in the east. Here I'm over in kind of the southeastern part of the sky, as a matter of fact. If you take, oops, sorry about that turning too fast mm -hmm. right now. If you take the uh, handle of the Big Dipper, you'll notice that it's kind of curved, kind of like a circular arc, and you want to follow that arc to this star right there. Okay, now since that drawing is terrible, I'll erase that immediately and <laughs> allow you to see what that star's name is. Remember, I said you follow the arc to Arcturus. And Arcturus is in this constellation. It's called Boötes. Um, yes, or you might pronounce it Booties, um, which is a lot of fun to say. Um, but, but yeah, it's not correct. Yeah, it's, 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 it's if, if you're having fun with it, that's all that matters to me. And it's why I don't mind. I'm not going to take the time to correct students or the public if they want to pronounce the planet that's after Saturn and before Neptune. If they don't want to say Uranus and they want to say the other one, that's okay with me. All right. That's okay with me. I mean, Uranus, was, right? What was that? Ura Uranus. 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 Yes. Uranus is the alternate pronunciation. That's hilarious to say. Uranus. Yes. Honestly, until about 50 years ago, I, it's my understanding that astronomers would just, you know, without any sense of irony, they would just pronounce it the way that everybody does for fun. So it's perfectly all right. So yeah, so there you go. That is Arcturus in the constellation Boötes. Um, if you were to continue that little curve that we just made there, here, I'll continue my drawing. So we did arc, oh, I have straight lines again. Sorry about that. We have arc to Arcturus. And now we'll make a straight line, which I failed to do <laughs> right there. So we'll make this little straight line down to this star here. And that star's name is called Spica. What we like to do is we like to say arc to Arcturus and spike to Spica. Some people say speed to Spica, and I'm going to be fine with them doing that. That's perfectly all right. Do you say speed to speaker or spike to spica? I say spike to spica, and yeah. I'm yeah, I, I'm I'm okay if somebody else wants to say speed to spica, but if they tell me that I should say it that way, I'm gonna kind of give them a stink eye. Yes, there's no planetary pronunciation police PPP. <laughs> <Okay>. uh <laughs>
if you want to set up that working group in the local planetarium association that that's fine <laughs> all right so spica is in the constellation virgo now you'll notice something very interesting here you see virgo you might know about virgo because virgo is one of our zodiac constellations leo also is a zodiac constellation and if you come back over here, remember Venus and Mars are in Gemini, another zodiac constellation. I'm going to draw a line for you all right now. There we go. This line's called the ecliptic. And notice the ecliptic runs through Gemini and Leo and Virgo and a few other constellations that you don't see up quite yet. Or I didn't turn the, I didn't click on them, like Cancer right here, for example. Um, but our whole zodiac's right there. The reason why they're called zodiac constellations is because the sun actually passes through all of those constellations. And you can see by the positions of Mars and Venus that the planets move through those as well. And in addition to the planets, the moon's actually the moon actually stays very close to the ecliptic too. And that is what I always offer to people to help them remember the name of the ecliptic. Because if the moon actually is directly on the ecliptic and the moon's at the right phase, you can actually have eclipses. So if I were to show you the ecliptic on June 10th, you'll see the moon is right on that ecliptic. Just like how the moon was on April 26th during the lunar eclipse. It was right on the ecliptic and that's why we can have a lunar eclipse on that day as well. All right. So what we're going to now do is show off a few things that you'll see a few hours later, because I know people love to look at the planets during these shows. So um, I've got it at nine o'clock still. Let's go ahead and go up one hour. Ooh, it's a lot darker now. That's nice. All right. That's 10 o'clock. Let's go to 11 o'clock. Midnight. Ooh, it's getting really late. One o'clock and I start to see our friends now. And we're going to go to two o'clock so they get higher up here. Okay. If you follow along the ecliptic, you can see more of our other planets up here in the sky. You can also see some other objects that are very fun to look at. Like right here, this is Waylena's favorite star, Antares. Antares, notice it's got a nice reddish color. It's in the constellation Scorpius. When Mars passes by this constellation, uh, sometimes people might put Antares in comparison to the red planet. And that's where it got its name. Its name essentially just means not Mars or in opposition to Mars uh, right there. Um, and then if you go farther over, you can see a little teapot right here. There's its handle, there's its lid, there's its spout. That's in the constellation Sagittarius. If you come over here, I wanna show this constellation. I'm gonna show you what I see when I see this but I know not everybody sees this. Right here, I see kind of a boomerang. It's not a good boomerang, but I see kind of a boomerang right there, okay? So Waylena, if you wanna draw that and have that in the planetarium dome, that's how I see this constellation. I don't know if I ever shared that with you before. Um, no, I don't think so. That's all right. I have my notebook. That's okay. Um, but what you're supposed to see here is actually a sea goat called Capricornus. And as we said, it is another one of the zodiac constellations. But there's a bright object in the middle of that sea goat or in the middle of that boomerang. It's right here. Let's zoom in on it and see what we've got. Oh, I think you folks can see it right there. It's surrounded by a bunch of its moons. That is clearly the planet Saturn. Saturn happens to be in Capricornus right now. Saturn is a gorgeous, gorgeous planet for many people. Saturn is their favorite planet to look at for photographs and to look at through a telescope because even with a small telescope, you can see those rings. You might not see the level of detail you're seeing in this photograph, but it shocks people how beautiful it is to look at. So it is always a favorite site. So I know it's really late at this time, but later this summer, it's gonna be rising earlier and earlier. So it'll be a great thing to catch coming up in late summer and in early fall. So something to look forward to folks. Um, now, just over to the left of this is another constellation that I have to admit for myself, I don't do a great job at pointing out this constellation. 
I just know which zodiac constellation is next, and that is Aquarius, okay? And you see there is a bright object in Aquarius right there, and I will click on it and zoom in one more time. Notice with this one, we've got moons around this planet, and they're actually in a direct line with each other. That is always the case because this planet doesn't have a tilt the way that Earth does, the way that Mars does, the way that Saturn does, okay? And so because of that planet not being tilted, its moons, which stay along its equator, they always stay in a nice straight line in the sky. It's really nice and helpful for you to find them. Oh, hey, Waylene, I think we got a good photo here too. Oh my gosh. Yeah, we should be like buying lottery tickets. Or Jackpot something. tonight. Okay. Tomorrow night, I should say. So at nine o'clock tomorrow night and at two o'clock on Sunday morning, you will get a view of the planet Jupiter with its great red spot. Although I have to admit, I think at one o'clock it's even better. Oops, sorry, that's the next day. Yeah, there is one o'clock. It's just barely rising, so it looks a little dimmer. Um, but still, that's a good view of Jupiter right there at 2 a.m. Um, you need a really powerful telescope in order to be able to see the great red spot, but at least with a smaller telescope, you can see these lovely, colorful, pretty cloud bands that we call the belts of Jupiter around the white zones, okay? Those can be seen with a relatively low-powered telescope. All right, so those are some of the things that we can see tonight, or really, I know I've been showing you tomorrow night, but it was worth it, right, folks? Okay, so let's go ahead and we will let the sun go and rise here now. I'm going to turn off all these things so we can actually watch that sunrise. There we go. Oh, all those little streaks across the sky right there, those are, those are satellites because I left those on from when we were uh, watching the ISS earlier. Um, yeah, there was another bright one right there too. Um, the fact is we have so many satellites passing overhead, there's lots of opportunities to see them. And thanks to the Starlink constellation, we are getting more and more each day. There was a really neat photo in astronomy picture of the day a few days ago where they showed how the Starlink satellites had photobombed the Orion Nebula. Is that right? Is that, you saw that one too? Yeah. Um, here, even if I don't put it, I'll share it maybe on the, uh, uh, with shared screen once I bring it up. And uh, before, after I get sunrise here, I will um, um, maybe get it uh, as a shared screen as well. Ah, uh, what was that bright object there? Hmm. I'm trying to remember right now. I am completely forgetting. We don't have any other planets to show, do we? This has to be a bright star, doesn't it? Or, or have we actually just seen the moon? I'm completely forgetting. Oh, that is the moon, isn't it? That is the moon because I just remembered two things. One, I did not scale my moon up. There we go. And two, since it is not June 10th yet, the moon is just before dawn. Okay. Now look, I forgot, but I used my reasoning. Yay. <laughs> so take a look here, folks. Right before dawn on uh, the next couple of nights, you will see a beautiful crescent moon coming up. And honestly, I think that that crescent moon is a better reason to wake up before dawn in the next few days than to look at that partial eclipse of the sun. That's, that's my personal opinion. What do you think about that opinion, Waylena? I'm sorry, I'm totally not paying attention because I just found the picture because from Astronomy Picture of the Day that you were talking about. So, yeah. sorry. That's okay. I need to, you know, teacher sent me to detention. I wasn't paying attention. No, oh, I'm usually okay. I have multiple screens and so I'm able to handle this better. That's okay. That's okay. I've got a link to the, the picture. I just threw that into the chat. Okay. Um, but what I'm oh, just I showing find you it folks, the hard way. That's okay. What I'm just showing you folks here is um, the crescent moon on Sunday morning, right before dawn. If you're curious about the exact time of this, this is at about five o'clock. And I gotta say that crescent moon is probably gonna be prettier than the tiny little sliver of partial eclipse we're gonna get on Thursday, right? That's beautiful. 
Yeah. So yeah. Clear. If you've got a clear sky before dawn, um, seeing a crescent moon right before the sun comes up is just such a little lovely treat. So here's what it looks like tomorrow morning. <laughs> hey, where'd my moon go? <laughs> I know what I did. So here's what it looks like tomorrow morning. Here's what it looks like Sunday morning, Monday morning, Tuesday morning. Wednesday morning, it'll be so low, it'll be behind our uh, building, and you probably <laughs> won't be able to catch that sliver. That'll be almost impossible, um, because look at how close it is to the sun. Mm -hmm. you, that, those are moons that are really tough to catch when it's at the very end or very beginning of a lunar cycle, um, or you know what we call a lunar month. So, but catching a nice little sliver of this moon like this is always neat to catch. What's really nice about it is that you can get enough reflected light from Earth to reflect off of the dark side of the moon, and you can usually see that part of the moon as well, which is which just adds to how pretty it is to to check out. So, so you've got a good chance for those in the next couple of days, and I think that's probably a better thing to look forward to than the solar eclipse. Um, but yeah, mark your calendars. The real solar eclipse to look forward to, 2024, April 8th. Okay. So Folks, do you have any that image from astronomy picture of the day? Those aren't actually starlings; those are all ge uh, geosynchronous. Oh, um, but we have, but 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 I should point out, as you know, Eric, we have seen uh, astronomy photos that have been photobombed by starlings. I'm just trying to find some of. There's those. one like there's a one with it passing through the Andromeda galaxy, right? So I think so. Okay. So we're talking about this. I probably should go and actually share it. I've got it on my screen yeah. um, because I forgot, because I think I didn't actually read through the article. I just assumed Starlink and I should have remembered one major point of difference with this. The Starlink satellites crisscross in all directions in very low earth orbit all around our planet because they're trying to bring high speed internet to every part of the earth's surface. Um, where there's people. Um, but by comparison, this image, as Waylena was saying, these are geosynchronous orbits. And geosynchronous orbits tend to be orbits that are centered around Earth's equator, right? Correct me if I'm wrong with that. I know there's the difference between geosynchronous and geostationary. Um, so, so you get a lot of orbits where the actual object is just hovering over the same spot on Earth constantly. And that means that that object is probably hovering over Earth's equator at that time. And what's nice is that the Orion Nebula is very, very close to the celestial equator. And that's why they can cause these little photobombs like you see in this image right here. What did Jeff contribute in the chat, chat to all of this? Ah. Uh -huh. Okay, let's see if I can get this clicked on here correctly. Oh, it, I had it open up in, uh, in a different web browser. Okay, so Jeff Bryant has just shared with us a picture of the Starlink satellites ch chain that came through Champaign. I assume this is a, an image of multiple um, passovers of uh, satellites. And honestly, we can add Jeff probably to uh, the panel to talk. Um, yeah, so, so about 60 passed overhead. Wow, okay. So yeah, um, what's been fun for me when I was doing observing sessions this spring with some of my students, um, I was able to see with heavens above when these things would be passing over. But in addition to knowing when one of those trains would pass overhead, there was one time where students were actually, I was trying to look through the telescope to set up an observation of an object and the student just asked, what's that overhead? And it's a Starlink train. <laughs> I hadn't known about that one passing overhead because it was actually one of the earlier launches from not the most recent launch. It was one that was a few days prior um, that just happened to be flying overhead. And I was like, those are Starlinks. And we had a few of them because there are thousands of these things going overhead right now. Um, here, I'll go over to this so you can get a sense of this. This is heavensabove.com right here. And you see that they actually offer Starlink predictions if I go and click on that. But if you wanna see how many Starlink satellites are going overhead, they've got a very 
demanding animation here. Look at that. This little streak right here, that is one of those Starling trains that Jeff was talking about. You can see another one down here. And if this is really taxing my computer's processor. That's why you're not seeing it moving right now. Um, but you can see how many are already covering this country, uh, covering the planet, I should say. Uh, we don't have many, very many up at the high latitudes and that's just because there aren't that many people up there. So they stay at orbits that are slightly less skewed than that. All right. Okay. So, um, yeah, that's about all I wanted to share there. Waylena, did you have anything you wanted to add? No, no. Just get out there and look. I mean, it's 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 wonderful. I'm so excited that Jupiter and Saturn are coming back. I just can't. I know I said that before. I'm like a broken record. Okay. And yes, I'm looking forward to seeing my favorite star again in the sky. Oh, wonderful. Uh, looks like Ellie wanted to hear some more about some zodiac constellations. How about I just take a quick tour through all of those right now? Um, and I will start sharing my screen one more time. Oh, I probably need to stop that orbit of the Starlink so that my computer stops screaming at me. <laughs> all right. Here, I'll just close those windows for the moment. Okay. All right, so the moon's in right here, and let's take a look at what constellation the moon happens to be in. Hello, there we go. Okay, so the moon happens to be in the next constellation over. That was Jupiter right there. I'm gonna take away the atmosphere so you can see all the stars right now. And the moon happens to be in this constellation, which is the constellation of the fishes, known as Pisces. OK, um, what's really neat about this, this is something that I've only learned in recent times. You can see that all of these three zodiac constellations are associated with water. OK, and there are various parts of the sky that are associated thematically in that fashion so that you can understand how people thousands of years ago ended up naming these constellations to help them tell stories and also to help them plan their agriculture, okay? So you can see how those would be associated with things like flooding and whatnot. Now, the next one down here, since we had clicked on the sun before, you can see the next constellation is right here. This is the constellation Taurus, but that's not the next constellation after Pisces. There's a very dim one that a satellite seems to be passing through right now, known as Aries the Ram. Okay, if I scroll out, I think we've got most of our zodiac constellations now. Um, yeah, so we've got Taurus and Gemini. We've got Cancer right here. Cancer doesn't have very many bright stars either, just like Aries. Honestly, the most common thing I look at when I look at the constellation Cancer is this bright deep sky object right in the middle of that constellation, right in the middle of the crab called the Beehive Cluster. And it's actually very bright, that cluster is. It's so bright, you can actually see it even without binoculars. You'll see a little fuzzy spot up there in the sky. Um, and then once you can get some binoculars or maybe a low powered telescope, it's, it's a real nice treat. All right, so then we have Leo and we have Virgo. Um, there's one constellation we skip between Virgo and Scorpius. Um, and that one is right here. It's the constellation Libra. Now, what's really funny about Libra is that um, two of the stars in Libra actually were named for being uh, just the claw stars of Scorpius. The scorpion actually used to be a lot bigger. Um, I guess he just wanted to tip the scales. I don't know what to tell you oh, with bad puns right there. Oh, oh, oh. Eric, oh. Are you going to make Jeff uh, allow him to use his audio so he can boo me too? Good. All right. <laughs> But those two claw stars that I was talking about in Libra have our favorite names for stars, okay? Just because of how ridiculously long they are. Zubin es Shamali and Zubin el Janubi 2. And is this Zubin el Janubi 1 down here? Oh, just Brachium, forget it. <laughs> but the point is, these names come from the Arabic, meaning the Southern claw star and the satellite that won't get out of the way. 
<laughs> and the northern claw star. It's a common Stellarium problem. If you've got satellites up, they'll just jump in, in, in your view. Um, but yeah, so those don't get nice scales named. They get claw star names. They're very fun like that. All right. And then yes, we have our we have the rest of them. I think we now have covered all the zodiac constellations. Oh, but what about the one that? Um, ah, yes, you got to right. add. You got to add that one. You're right. I guess if today is Donut Day, we need to give you a baker's dozen, don't we? Wink. <laughs> okay. I want my wacky inflatable tube guy. <laughs> you wacky waving inflatable arm flailing tube man. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that is fine. Well, folks, but notice stepping that on the scorpion. <laughs> ah, gotcha. <laughs> so, anyways, between Sagittarius and Scorpius, you can find some really bright stars here, and those stars actually happen to be part of a different constellation called Ophiuchus. Now, what's nice is not only am I giving you a baker's dozen, I'm actually giving you a 14th constellation here as well. Ophiuchus happens to be holding a serpent whose name is Serpens. Serpens actually gets split in two because of Ophiuchus. So this is Serpens caput and Serpens cauda right there, the head and the tail of the snake. Uh, but Ophiuchus is just basically known for being the snake handler. So right there. Um, now, what's funny is that this eye right here of Ophiuchus, that's not actually in the constellation Ophiuchus. That's actually the head of Hercules, which is really wild. <laughs> yeah. I always found that so amazing. You've got Rosal Jeffy right here and Rosal Hagee. So it's like two Rosas right next to each other, two heads. They're better than one. <laughs> is that enough puns for us to quit? <laughs> All right. Well, folks, I have stunned Waylina with my horrible commentary, and I hope you folks have enjoyed this evening. We're going to allow some more uh, comments uh, off the recording here. Um, but nevertheless, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Our next uh, of these shows is going to be two weeks from now. It'll be our last edition of Spring Prairie Skies for 2021. Um, and we'll follow that up with a Summer Prairie Skies starting in July. But yes, thank you so much for joining us.